What's up, my friends? You guys know me. My name is Beto Gudiño, hailing from Guadalajara, Mexico, broadcasting from Costa Mesa, California. Welcome to Christian Podcast Live, a conversation with God thinkers on topics of Christianity and culture through the lens of emoji reactions that range from blasphemous to divine. And what I mean by Christian Podcast Live is one shot, authentic, real conversation with hopefully minimal or no editing. Why? One, because it's time consuming. And second, because I believe in transparency. Okay, so on today's episode, we have Dominic Crossan. I think I got it right. And he's the author of Render Unto Caesar, The Struggle for Christ and Culture in the New Testament. Dominic, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? It's a pleasure to be with you, Beto. I'm doing fine. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm so excited for this. And let me just put this right here. There we go. So you have on your background an amount full of books written by you. Is that correct? <laughs> It's a bit pretentious, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, wow, that is amazing. Usually, usually people have tons of books in their background. I have like, I mean, maybe like 20. I've read maybe half of them. <laughs> But uh, sometimes when I talk to people, they have their library behind them of the books they read. <laughs> But in this case, it's the books you've authored. So that's already amazing. I'm excited for today's conversation, Dominic. So Dominic, I'm just... It, I'm doing it as a bit of a joke, to be honest with you, you know, <laughs> because everyone puts their library. All of a sudden, everyone has a library. So I said, okay, I put up the last 30 years of my books. <laughs> Perfect. Just the last 30. Okay. Amazing. Well, welcome to the show, Dominic. Can you just introduce the audience a little bit to who you are, a little bit your, of your background, uh, maybe where you come from or what's your um, your background in, in theology or faith? How are you connected even to the scriptures? Well, you can, you can probably hear from my accent. I'm from Ireland. I came over here because I joined a Roman Catholic religious order. I was a member of a 13th century religious order for 19 years and a priest for the last 12. And they actually decided that since I went to a boarding school in Ireland, which had five years of Greek and five years of Latin, when I entered the order, I entered the order to do what I was told, you know, and they said, you're going to be a professor. So they sent me back to get my doctorate in Ireland, sent me off to Rome for a two-year diploma after that in exegesis and two years more in Jerusalem for archaeology. So they made me who I am, and I love it. So actually, I didn't make the decision. But then when I left the order in 1969, I joined DePaul University, and I'm now an emeritus professor. Emeritus is a Latin term, which means you get to live in Florida <laughs> and That's instead what it of means. Chicago, <laughs> and you don't have great papers and go to meetings. You, you're, still, you're still a professor, but you don't have any of the the normal duties of teaching so i get to lecture and write wow in florida what amazing what amazing journey okay dominic so this is what i do at the beginning of the show i offer my emoji reaction so i have your book right here in my hands and okay. i'll let you in on my virtual background right here on my on our zoom call just so you can see my emojis so i'm pretentious myself And, okay. I, <laughs> and I use emojis on my background. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the gods of Emojitron, what is my reaction <laughs> to render onto Caesar? So is everybody ready? Because here we go. Oh, uh oh, we're going to the Emoji Tombola to ask gods of Emojitron, reveal the emoji. All that right. we're gonna have today. The Oscar. <laughs> it's, like, Oscar. it's like the Oscar. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> And it's the skeptical emoji. I'm a little skeptical. Why okay. is that? How do you feel, Dominic, that I'm a little skeptical as I was reading this book? You are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay? 
But skeptical about what? Um, Me well, or Caesar or God? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Caesar or God. Well, I, I think skeptical for me is just maybe I ended up with more questions than answers. And I think, I mean, I'm all about asking questions. So I think okay. we're on to for a fun, fun chat today on the episode. <laughs> I'm, I ask questions too. Awesome. Okay, Dominic. So here's the first question. And it's kind of like moving on to the very last chapter on the book okay. and maybe a little bit about the wrap mm. up of the story before we go into the coin in the book because i want to know about where this coin comes from that would be amazing but first uh, is the universe evolving into justice it better be as far as i can understand Cosmic evolution and human evolution, not talking now about religion for the moment, it is eminently fair, not the way I would consider it to be fair, but fair to the physical world, the animal world, the human world. And I think our invention, the human invention of escalatory violence, by that I mean, this is, I consider a fact, We came out of Africa, our species, Homo sapiens. I would prefer in sapiens, but in any case, hmm. it's a bit of an oxymoron, the wise Homo. Anyway, we came out of Africa and we declared war, I think, on the planet hmm. and its animals and ourselves. And I think the challenge now is beyond ethics or morals or anything else, or even cases where absolutely you can see violence violent defense is defensible. Escalatory violence seems to me to be our drug of choice as a species, talking as a species now, not mm. talking about Christians or anything else, as a species. And I don't know how we're going to get out of it because mm. we've never invented a weapon we didn't use and we never invent a weapon which is less <laughs> disastrous, I might say, than the preceding one. So... I would say, as I look at the human species, and that's what I'm trying to look at, really. I see we're on a collision course with our own destruction. Mm. I'm not sure if we destroy ourselves before we destroy the planet, but the term I'm after always is escalatory. It's not that there's always been violence in human life. I mean, fine, of course there has. It's the escalatory nature of human violence, or even of climate, intensifying climate control. Escalation is what worries me, and the trajectory of escalation. I'm not a prophet. Hmm. I know no more about the future than anyone else, except that everyone who's ever said anything about the future has been wrong. That's all I know about the future. Yeah. So, so someday that's going to be wrong too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's going to get it right. Wow. <laughs> But in the meanwhile, there's a trajectory. So that. Hmm. I'm not skeptical about that. Wow. Okay. Super interesting. Um, so you are talking about violence and its escalation as human species from the beginning. And it sounds sounds like it kind of worries you, right? And I think that's, I mean, that's the end of the book is pretty much um, lies on that question. So how is that tied to render onto Caesar the struggle for Christ and culture. And I don't know if this is the, maybe the time where you want to talk about this coin on the cover of your book. Um, but what, what is this phrase, render onto Caesar? Well, most people would probably know there is the render onto Caesar, the phrase. They know the phrase, the aphorism, render onto Caesar, the things that are Caesar's. It's actually render back in, in Greek, it's apodatic, render back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, if you bother looking that up in the New Testament, it's not a one-liner. Jesus has lots of one-liners, blessed are the poor. And he's great at one-liners, by the way. But this is a whole story. This is an incident. Some people ask him a question. And by the way, You ask Jesus a question, Jesus always wins. That's taken for <laughs> granted. You're not going to win. Okay. Yeah. So you ask Jesus, somebody asks him, and it's kind of a challenge. Uh, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, you know, if he says no, 
<laughs> that's probably treason if he says uh, to the Romans, if he says, yes, that's treason to the Jews. So it's a trap. And what he does is a counter trap. I don't carry the coin, he says. You got you to gotta show me the coin. Hmm. Then he asks them, counter question, whose image and inscription, two words, image and inscription is this. They show it to him. And then he comes out with this render to Caesar thing. Now, we have to imagine, because we don't know, what coin were they showing him? Hmm. Or even what coin is Mark imagining? What coin best explains what he comes up with? That's the question you have to ask when you're trying to figure the coin. Is it likely to be a Latin coin with lots of abbreviations in it that's really small, say the size of our dime? that I have one of them. I have a copy of one of them, actually. It's not a real one, of course, but it's a copy. Nice little silver one. I can't read it without using a magnifying glass, and it's abbreviated. Hmm. Or is it the one we put, for example, on the cover of the book? And this, by the way, is not an original idea. It's an idea from an Australian numismatist, and I think he's right, because it says on this in Greek, and it's about an inch in diameter, Three nice big Greek words. In, in English, they say that Caesar is God. So it's Theos, God, Caesar, Caesar, or Sebastos, Caesar. So Jesus has shown a coin that says Caesar is God. And instead of saying, yes, it is, he separates them. So he's offered a coin that equates them, and he says, separates them. That must have left everyone saying, hmm. Did he say yes or no? His emojis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did he say? <laughs> did he say, don't pay? Or did he say, well, if you carry the coin, you pay the taxes. If you don't carry the coin, like I do, you don't have to pay the taxes. How can you pay taxes? You got no coin. So they must have gone away with saying, hey, what did he say? But the key thing that Jesus did. He got himself out of his little trap, of course. But he said something profound. In his world, whether we like it or not, Caesar was considered God. And Caesar, of course, was a human being. Augustus Caesar lived and died as a human being. But in that world, it was possible for someone who had done something of extraordinary value for the human race and thereby demonstrated divine power to be considered divine. Now, maybe we don't do it, though I see you have an emoji there. The first century Latins would be quite happy with your emoji. They'd say divine. Oops, that's Caesar we're talking about. And then you got this, this Jew, and he says, no, there's things for Caesar, and there's things for God. Huh. So they're not equated. They're divided. Hmm. So in one sense, that's the setup for the book. Okay. If... The New Testament, Jesus says, Caesar and God is divided. Then you have to ask, what's Caesar, what's God, and all the rest of it. And then you see, how does the New Testament reconcile that? We, we've got to live under both of them. I don't know anyone who's living <laughs> without both. So if they're separated, how do you reconcile them? How do you acculturate them? What do you do with it? So that gets us into then the New Testament. The coin is the setup in a way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we get to the New Testament, and you said it right. Um, you said acculturated, and <clears throat> so one of the the ideas I guess I get from the book is that um, there's, I mean, you talk about the Book of Revelations written by John, and yeah. then you talk about the almost like the, the two volume piece, or maybe it's just one, one volume piece of Luke, the gospel of Luke, and then the acts of the apostles, right? Which were written by the same author. And, and then you kind of say, okay, there's two visions of how we can read this. We can read it as, as almost like as one is the sequel to the other. So the acts of the apostles is the sequel to the gospel of Luke, or you can say, uh, no, they were written from the beginning as one, one piece right so 
Okay, so when we talk about acculturation, first of all, like, what do you mean by acculturation in terms of of New Testament and specifically like these two books or these two visions of of what does it mean to render unto God the things that okay. are God's? But first of all, the term acculturation simply means going along with your culture. And maybe you're going along with it because all the news tells you that this is the way it is, that Russia went into Ukraine as tourists or something like that. They were just on a visit. You know, they just wanted to see what the countryside looked like. If everyone tells you that and nobody can tell you anything else, you may take that. You are acculturated to that. You happen to be wrong, but that's something else. So I looked, first of all, at two absolutely opposite answers to that problem. The first one is the book of Revelation. By the way, very often people pluralize that. It's revelation because it's the revelation. It's not <laughs> revelations. And basically the theme of the book of Revelation is that this is it. The Roman, the Romans slaughtered Christians in the immediate past. And Christ is coming back soon on a war horse to slaughter Chris, to slaughter Romans, sorry, to slaughter Romans in the imminent future, sort of, you know, turn around. He, they did that to us. He's going to do that to them. So acculturation there is absolutely demonized. Don't have anything to do with the Romans. They're evil. They're pornographically evil. They're murderously evil. You want to say, come on, we nobody's that bad. But it goes on with image after image. It's like a kaleidoscope. You don't have time to think. Another image is coming at you. But there are always two images, murdering Romans and avenging Christ, and it's happening soon. Now, there's only two problems with that. The first half is a lie. The Romans did not murder Christians. They really didn't. The first time the Roman Empire declared Christianity up for, <laughs> for, for persecution was about the year 250, and it was much too late then. What Nero did in the 60s after the Great Fire was even considered by Roman aristocrats as being a problem for Nero and not for the Christians. So this, unfortunately, the first half is a lie, it just didn't happen. There is no proof of murders in the sense that the, the main Roman activity was slaughtering Christians, it just isn't there. And the second part is a libel. The Christ that came into Jerusalem on a donkey it's not coming back on a war horse to slaughter, as if somehow the incarnation was a mistake and we have to correct it. So I'm looking at that, though, as one answer. God and Caesar, Caesar is demonized, you don't have anything to do with him, he's evil, he's murdered, all the rest of it. Now, turn to an opposite answer. And here I want to be very careful. <clears throat> Everyone knows that we now have four Gospels, and the third one is the Gospel according to Luke. Then you have John's Gospel, and then the fifth book of the New Testament is called the Acts of the Apostles. Those are the names put on them, not put on by the authors. The question then is, do we have a book and a sequel? In other words, let me, let me put it in popular language. Let's say Luke wrote the Gospel according to Luke, and everyone loved it, and everyone loved it. They say, you know, you really should write a sequel. Like today, you know, your, editor, your editors all say, that sold really well, got to do a sequel. So you do a sequel, and it looks back a bit at the previous volume, of course, like Jaws 2 looks back at Jaws, the movie. Mm -hmm. But you didn't plan a two-volume book. What you planned was a book and a sequel. It, it's, it's a question of logistics. It's not anything profound. If I told my editors at Harper when I have a thousand-page book, and they accepted it, which they wouldn't, of course, they say that would have to go into a two-volume set. And you can, run the, you can run the numbers all the way through and all the rest of it, but we'll give you a box set. This is the problem that Luke has. He wants to write a book that's about 80,000 words long in Greek, something like that, and he can't fit it into one scroll. He needs two scrolls. A volumen, volume, is the Latin word for a scroll. So any author in the first century has a first logistical problem. Can I get my stuff into one scroll, two scrolls, seven scrolls, say for Josephus's Jewish war? 
then there's a danger that somebody might divide your two scrolls and you'll end up with what looks like a book and a sequel. And what they have done is ruin the whole thing. So the argument is that I'm going to call it Luke Acts hyphenated mm -hmm. was originally conceived, imagined, planned, constructed, written, published <laughs> as a two volume work. And when people were organizing the New Testament, as they had to, and they decided to put, say, the stories about Jesus up front, they simply divided it. So we got what we had. Now, when you put them back together then, that's what I had to do first, to imagine them as a whole. What you have is the exact opposite to the book of Revelation. As far as Luke is concerned, the future is not Jewish Christianity, but Roman Christianity. That's why the whole book moves westward, 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 steadily till it gets to Rome. Then it stops. It doesn't even tell you what happened to Paul, <laughs> who's supposed to go there under trial. You know, if, you were, if you were making a movie of the Acts of the Apostles, no editor would ever accept it without saying, tell me what happened to Paul. He's going there to be tried. Your book ends by saying he talked freely for two years and you leave us all hanging. Go back to your drawing board <laughs> and tell me what happened. Make it up if you have to. <laughs> so those are the two absolutely opposing answers in the New Testament itself. Demonize Caesar or canonize Caesar. Mm. In other words, Luke Acts prepares for Constantine, put it bluntly. Wow. Okay, that's, wow, that's super interesting, and that's well put into almost like lay terms, I would say, that my brain can easily understand. Um, so I guess in my tradition or upbringing, I would see the New Testament in a role of almost like a cohesive uh, theme or even even when I think of the New Testament as people like putting together, these are the books that are to be as canonized, right, in the New Testament, I think, what did they see to put it together in that sense that obviously and evidently you're not you're not seeing right now? You're saying, no, this, this, these books are way too different. Like, would you have canonized those books into the same um, canon, like it's the New Testament, or would you have said, oh, these need to be separated, like in... in Are they one of the same thing or not? No, I'm perfectly happy. I'm perfectly happy with the New Testament. Let me be clear. People, people decided to keep certain things. And let me take that example. The book of Revelation was highly contested. We have an account around 325 of the books that are really in, are really out, and eh, the maybe books. And it's one of the maybe books. 50 years later, it's in. It could have gone either way. But the people who are assembling it are trying. They're not doing it stupidly. They decide the first thing we're going to talk about is Jesus. So Luke, whether he likes it or not, is going to become the gospel according to Luke. And then it's, it, I wouldn't change anything because that would put it underground. You know, when I read the book of Revelation, it tells me this. Among those early Christians were Christians who were thoroughly dissatisfied with this idea of a Jesus who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey to protest against war and violence. They said, fine, fine, fine. We'll put that, put back there. Now let's bring him back. Enough with this donkey stuff. Let's bring him back on the battle charger and let him slaughter people because that's what he does. He really does. You read chapter 19 and see if you don't blank. <laughs> Blanche, I mean. That's a declaration that Jesus blew it. <laughs> the whole incarnation was a mistake. We need a, as we say, a second coming. The first coming failed. That would make Paul turn over in his grave. <laughs> yeah, okay. And scream. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, the, yeah. So that's where I feel like we, 
um, I mean, I appreciate this conversation, first of all, because I feel like you're, it's like the first time I'm talking scripture with somebody that has a different vision. So, because when I think of the, the, when I think of revelation, I, I guess it's just maybe my tradition. Um, but I think in terms of a future, right. And you just said at the beginning, you know, like who, whoever, whoever predicted the future and it happened. Right. And even as you were saying that, it's like, even what I'm saying, right. It's this, it's, I'm not predicting anything like who can predict it. And I guess the idea was, no, there is a future. There is a second coming. There is a, this idea that Christ is returning to earth as he came, right. As the disciples saw him leave, um, he's coming. So you're saying that you have a different interpretation of that. I'm saying he never left. Oh. I'm saying exactly what he said. Imagine I would be with you all days. Wow. This idea that he's gone on vacation somewhere, mm. coming back, is absolutely un New Testament Christian. <laughs> it's un Christian. Wow. The, uh, okay. Anyone who's coming back soon ain't here. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so that will move us into the role of the Holy Spirit. Like from your vantage point, what is who who is the holy spirit like is that when when you're saying you know he's already here is that what i would say yes is the holy spirit that jesus said i'm gonna go but i'll send the holy spirit or do you have a different vision of even the holy spirit on earth no i let me stick with luke acts as long as we're talking about it in chapter four of luke acts jesus goes into the synagogue at nazareth filled with the holy spirit it says by the way driven by the holy spirit and he says Today is the day in which God cleans up the world. <laughs> Basically, that's a rough translation. And how does he clean up the world? Well, by lifting up the downtrodden, by giving sight to the blind, by releasing captives. That's the domestic agenda of the Holy Spirit. It's spelled out for us there. Luke 4, anyone can read it. It's not, not me at all. And in fact, of course, Uh, Jesus, or Luke's Jesus, is quoting from Isaiah chapter 61, the prophecy that someday in the future, if I can use my language again, God is going to clean up the mess of the world. And when you ask for the description in Isaiah 61, chapter, uh, verses 1 to 2, it is again, he's going to lift up the downtrodden, mm. the captives, the dead, the lame, Then Jesus comes along and says, stay is the day. And everyone in the audience would say, eh, what does he mean? And the emojis must have gone blah, 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 all over the synagogue. <laughs> Some of them back there said, eh, no way. The skeptical emojis were, were doing it. Some guy said, we don't like this guy. We even wanted to kill him. So there was murderous emotion. They went way beyond blasphemous. Mm -hmm. But they had, they had your range of emojis. And some people said, divine, this is the word of God. This is the Holy Spirit at work, not just talking about it. This is what it looks like. Hmm. So if you want to see what the Holy Spirit means for Luke Acts, you start with Luke 4, and then you watch the, the genius of Luke Acts was this. He had a compositional problem. He's got two, two volumes. Jesus, if he makes Jesus the protagonist of the first volume, he's going to have nobody left for the second volume. Mm. <laughs> if I could go back again to my <laughs> movie, if you kill Jaws, if you kill the great shark in Jaws, then what are you going to do for Jaws too? You got to introduce a new shark or something. So Jesus is gone, but Luke's great idea is to make the Holy Spirit of God the two-volume protagonist. He comes on Jesus, and Jesus is baptized at the Jordan. He comes on the apostles at Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit is running the whole show. There is a scene in, in the Acts of the Apostles, as we call it, where Paul is poised in what we would call northwest Turkey <laughs> today, and the Holy Spirit won't let him go north to the Black Sea. Good idea today, actually. Or won't let him go down to the Aegean. It makes him go west. The Holy Spirit keeps pushing, pushing, pushing westward to Rome. Because Luke Acts is about Roman Christianity. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit 
of justice in plain language. Not, not retributive, punitive justice, but distributive justice for everyone, especially the downtrodden, because they're the ones who, <laughs> who get hurt in it, get a fair shake. Now, let me be blunt. There's an awful lot of Christians around who really don't like that Holy Spirit. They're quite happy that the Holy Spirit should distribute stuff to the top 1% or whatever it is, all the way down. But the idea that the Holy Spirit's job description is lifting up the downtrodden. Read, read the New Testament, and the New Testament is claiming to be the fulfillment of prophecies from the Old Testament. But that's what they were waiting <laughs> to write the whole Old Testament. Okay. So that's the Holy Spirit. Okay, awesome. All right, so we have clarified uh, the vision of Revelation as demonizing empire. And okay. then yeah. what you call uh, Luke Acts as emphasizing Rome, right? Or Accommodating. Uh, accommodating. Accommodating. Okay. So hey, when, when Luke Jesus... Probably say, why can't we be a good Christian and a good Roman? I want to be a good Christian, but I want to be able to trade with the Roman Empire. It's a... It's globalization, you know, Mediterranean globalization. I'd like to get with the program. I got a business here at Ephesus. I'd like to be able to, of course, I'm not going to believe that Caesar is God, but I'd like to do business with the Romans. So, Okay, that's an interesting point. So what, what does it mean when Jesus says, render unto God what is God's? So, I mean, you already talked about justice. I would assume that is one of the elements that Jesus meant when he says render unto God what it's got. So on your, from your vantage point, I guess in, in the book you would call it the kingdom of God or God's, God's kingdom, I guess. Um, what are some of the elements that make up the kingdom of God that when Jesus says render unto God what is God's, what are those elements um, in our day and age? Like, would you yeah, say okay. justice is one of them? Is there more? For for example, though, I, I do have a void because some people don't like the term kingdom of God because it's either too male, kingdom. So even, you know, even you have kingdoms run by queens. So it's, you know, I, I use God's rule. What, pe what people are trying to imagine, here's what they're trying to imagine in ordinary language. If God was down here, Or let me put in American terms. If God created a federal budget, what would it look like? That's the American way of saying God's rule. What would it look like if God was running the show? Not up there in heaven, you know, with, with popes or, <laughs> or priests or monks or anyone telling you what God wants. But supposing God, you know, <laughs> was on television every evening and said, here's the rule, here's what's going on. I ran a podcast, you know, regularly. <laughs> with only one emoji, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, what would it be like? That's, that's what the entire Old Testament is asking, a simple question. What would this world be like if it was properly won? And yes, yes, I think the core of it is distributive justice. Now, our problem, of course, is when we hear justice, we think immediately of retributive justice, punishment in plain language. We talk about the Department of Justice. That's not about distribution. Or the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That's not about distribution. But the primary meaning in the Bible of justice is how does everyone get a fair share? And it's been asked especially by a small battered people on the Levantine coast that we call Israel, who, who's had every empire there ever was with their boot on their neck. So the Old Testament is filled with when's go to God, clean up the mess of the world, and everyone get a fair shake. We've had the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans. It's always the empires. That's all we ever hear about. When will everyone get a fair share? That basically is the theme. Now, it's written in you know language. It's very specific, and you have to study it hard to find out what's going on. But right across from the Old Testament into the New Testament, and Jesus and Paul are in complete continuity with Torah and prophets. They want to know what would a world run by God look like? And of course, by describing 
the program, they're describing God. Because hmm. to say that, well, it will be a, a just world where everyone gets a fair share, you're telling me that you imagine that God is somebody who has concern for the downtrodden because they're not getting a fair share. And my problem, or not my problem, my vision is that I'm getting the same message from the Old Testament and the New Testament's vision of God that I'm basically getting from human evolution. God keeps telling me throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, empire doesn't work. I look at history. That seems right to me. There never was an empire that didn't say we're here forever, and there never was one that didn't go eventually. So I'm getting like two vectors, one from heaven, human evolution, backed by cosmic evolution, the other by the biblical tradition, and they seem to me to be pointing in the same direction. Hmm. That's a heck of a coincidence. Wow. Yes. Okay. So I have two questions. Um, and maybe you, I mean, it'd be kind of fun if you choose either one to answer right now, like your choice to say. Okay. So one would be, uh, I mean, it's, maybe it's kind of easy or simple, but is America the new Roman Empire? Um, or the other one is, the role of Satan as the enemy within that you wrote on page 74. Let me see if I can get to the two of them. Is, is America the new empire? Okay, in, nine, in what, 2007, I wrote a book on God and empire, and everyone was saying then, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and all that, we are the new Roman empire. We are the only superpower admitted, come out in the open. Let me, let me leave America aside for a moment. It, look at the first century Roman history. Here's what happened to Rome. They started off with, I won't say a king, let's say they started off with a dictator, with an autocrat. They got rid of him and created a republic, a republic. Then they got an empire. Then they had a civil war. <laughs> Then they got rid of their republic. And then they got an autocrat, and that would be Caesar Augustus. Now, if I look at that, you know, curve from one to the other, and I then turn to America, I see we started off by getting rid of George III. <laughs> I'm Irish. We tried to do it too. We didn't do it so well. Um, we tried. We got rid of an autocrat. Let's say in this country, we got a republic, of course. Then we started to get an empire, first of all, a continental empire, as you well know, and then eventually a hemispheric empire and eventually a global empire. We had a civil war, just like the Romans. I think in the last years and still going on, there's danger, and I'm not the only one saying this, and I have nothing to add to it beyond what others are saying. We're in danger of losing our republic and getting and wanting to get an autocrat again. It seems to me that we are poised, and I'm not the only one saying this, obviously, we're poised at a point where we're following the scenario of the Roman Empire almost step by step. So if we are the new Roman Empire, then we're heading for exactly what they got in the first century, an autocrat. Now, They could have got worse, to be fair, than Caesar Augustus. But if you look at what happened in the next five emperors, Caligula was assassinated, the third one. And what would be the fifth one, Nero, was es escaped assassination by suicide. So in their first autocrats, that's the score. Augustus, okay, they looked out. The first one, I think, was as good as you probably could get in the first in that world. And Augustus knew where to stop, by the way. <laughs> He knew not to go over the Elbe, <laughs> or over the Rhine. Keep the Rhine. <laughs> Don't go too far. Don't go across the Euphrates. He had enough sense as an autocrat that there are limits. And you can't guarantee that with an autocrat. 
because they are self-powerful. That's what the term means, autocrat. My, the power is me. That's what an autocrat means. Mm. So in answering your first one, if we are operating as the new Roman Empire, and that has been said by enough politicians in the past, and of course we have all sorts of things that look like the Roman Empire, then it looks like we might be on a scenario. And if we are going to lose our republic, then take a good look at the first <laughs> dynasty in Rome, <laughs> the first five. Hmm. The second question was Satan. The One of the interesting books that I mentioned, uh, Elaine Pagels, for example, talks about how very often groups, when they start by talking about somebody as being satanic, is talking not about the opponents outside. In other words, the Romans are murderous and they're evil and they're pornographic, but the real danger is somebody inside who is in favor of Rome. There's the one that they reserve the word satanic for. You think, well, isn't, isn't Rome kind of satanic? Yeah, but the real one is the traitor within, the apostate. Well, the apostate might be gone. So it's really the heretic is the dangerous one because the heretic is inside or the traitor is inside. The one who leaves the country or leaves the church, that they're gone. Hmm. So you notice that in the, new te- in the book of Revelation, the satanic focus is especially on the false prophet. The false prophet is obviously within the community. And if you're trying to understand them and not use just name calling, here's what's going on. Rome was a globalization. It was a Mediterranean globalization. It wasn't like the, the globe. I mean, you could, you can mock them, but you know, Caesar is always shown with the orb in his hand. That's the world. <laughs> so globalization meant the, the Roman globalization. It was very good for business. If you were in business, anywhere, it was good to be in that network. If you were a Christian in those churches that Paul, uh, that's sorry, that John writes to along the, the Western seaboard of Turkey today, all of those towns there are well integrated into Roman globalization. Now, if I'm in the olive oil business, <laughs> or especially if I'm in something like ivory carving, I'm a good Christian. I really am. I don't believe Caesar is God. I believe God has revealed, been revealed to me in Christ. I try to live by the Holy Spirit. Why can't I be a good Roman and get into business with my friend down the street who is a good pagan Roman, doesn't believe a thing about Christ? Can't we agree that religion is separate and we just do business in ivory? This is what... John of Patmos, who's writing Revelation, tears his hair out. And he sets out to write a story about Rome, which is so awful. And to do it with stunning images. So you don't have time to think before you're hit with another image. You're stunned into science. How can you have anything to do with Rome? It's so evil, so murderous, so pornographic. Look at the words he uses for Rome itself, for the city. He calls it a brothel. If I may use more polite language. Hmm. So all these merchants who are traveling around uh, the Mediterranean going to Rome, he says they're all going to the great brothel of the Mediterranean. It's devastating language. But his purpose is to make certain that those satanic people... (laughs) inside the community who are saying, couldn't we acculturate, you know, a little bit? He sees that as a great slippery slope. No, 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 (laughs) don't do anything. So that's where the language comes in. That's especially important for inside the community, satanic Mm -hmm. language. Wow. Wow. Okay. For sure. If I think of revelation is I get those, (laughs) <laughs> emojis i get those emotions right like i i i mean even maybe as growing up it would be almost like uh 
a little bit of taboo talking about revelation because of all those images that seem uh, just harsh or out there, like you're saying, no pornographic. And then you know, sometimes it, it even gets to the other, like the, the opposite end where some people make memes of it and it becomes like, this is, this is what an angel would look like in the Bible. Right. And they try to make like an actual picture and it's like, wow, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. Right. It's not the, the beautiful white angel with you no know, white wings and all of that. But okay, so we have these two. I love how you said there's an extreme. There's, I mean, you you kind of portray the vision of these are the two extremes. And so, would it be? Would the question be, what's at the center, or even is yeah. it necessary mm -hmm. to move to the center? It, and the question would be, is the center God's rule, like you call yeah. it? Well, there's a, you know, the, the third whole chapter of the book, the last chapter of the book, then asks, okay, Jesus comes out with his great, you know, separation, but he's got to live and die. So how did he operate? Now, I, since I've gone into the New Testament and found two absolutely <laughs> different visions and answers, there's no point in going in for the third one. So what I did in the... the final chapter of the book is I said, okay, could we leave the New Testament aside just for the moment and go to Josephus, a contemporary of Jesus living in the first century, and ask, supposing we only had Josephus, who does mention Jesus twice, by the way, by the way, twice. Let's go in there and see what we might find out about Jesus. How did he live? Let's let's take a look at Josephus, living a Jew in the first century, who certainly believed that God <laughs> was the God of the Bible. And let's take a look at what he says about acculturation. And it's fascinating because, on the one hand, he says, God has given power to the Romans. He, do he doesn't say there's God and Caesar. He says there's God and Caesar. God has given power to Caesar. Don't rebel against Caesar. Then on the other hand, he knows, of course, that the first century, 4 BCE and 66, his own people rose in violent rebellion against Rome, as colonial people have done from time immemorial. It's the whole history of my own Irish homeland. You keep rising, 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 in the hope that one day you'll win or else they just get so tired and go away, <laughs> which is sometimes what happens. They just get tired and go back to their homeland, the empire. So in any case, that's what I went. I started with, with uh, Josephus, and here's what's fascinating about Josephus. He tells you quite clearly about the Great Rebellion, violent rebellion against Rome of 4 B.C., which is put down, of course, by the legions. There's no legions in the homeland. They come in from Syria, put it down, and they crucify 2,000 people in Jerusalem, 4 BCE. Next time, 66, rebellion again, legions come back, crucify 500 a day in Jerusalem to the ran out of trees. But in the meanwhile, in between those two violent rebellions, Josephus admits I'm going to say admits, sort of through gritted teeth, that they were also practicing, I'm going to say inventing non organized, nonviolent resistance. Please hear me. Organized, programmatic, nonviolent resistance. They were experimenting. I'm talking about the Jews, and I'm talking about Jesus, leaving him aside for the moment. If he never existed, we have ample evidence in Josephus. Again, I didn't discover it. <laughs> I just underlined it. Josephus, and he doesn't like it, of course. He, you're not supposed to rebel in any way against Caesar because God has put Caesar in charge. That's his position. He doesn't say God and Caesar. He says God has put Caesar in charge in this world. Don't rebel. But Honestly, Josephus is almost more tolerant of violent armed rebellions as being part of life. But what really sends him crazy is this nonviolent resistance. People just sitting down, 
and saying to the governor, Pilate, or even to the legate from Syria, Petronius, if you don't stop doing X, we're not moving. It's like a sit-down strike. Now, I know you're probably thinking I'm just impo- taking stuff from Martin Luther King and putting it back in the New Testament or Gandhi. Ah, it's there. They sit down and they do it either at harvest time or at sowing time, so they endanger the whole agricultural program. And they challenge. The examples are all in the book, by the way. They simply say, if you continue doing this, then you're going to have to kill us. It's nonviolent, organized, nonviolent resistance backed by martyrdom, if necessary. That was, I, I, I use the word invented because as a historian, I don't know of it ever happening before. Mm-hmm. I don't mean individuals might do it, but organizing it to say, if we all do this together, if we all go before Pilate's Praetorium at Caesarea and sit down, or, be, or to, to somewhere else, say it uh, on the co and do it, what can they do to us? They can't kill us all. Now, of course, that's a very, 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 very dangerous thing to do. Of course, they can't kill you all. They'll just start killing you, the ones up front, and then everyone will run, presumably. But if you read Josephus, again, I say all the examples are in the book, and I quote them so you don't have to go reading Josephus. So he's on the web, you can easily read him. You can watch in the homeland of Israel in the first century, People experimenting with nonviolent in between the two great violent rebellions. Of course, that's when you do it. <laughs> when it starts, there ain't no nonviolent resistance. When the violence starts, probably you get killed in any case. So I put Jesus and John the Baptist, of course, in that context of nonviolent resistance. And Jesus saying, This is God's, the way you establish God's will on earth by nonviolent resistance to the normalcy of imperial civilization. Wow. And I, I'm really, I want to make it very clear. Chapters, I've forgotten the numbers, but I do the chapters on Josephus first. Then I ask, do I find what Jesus is doing congruent with this? Hmm. Just as a tactic. I'm not saying that Josephus is more important, but I'm saying... If you find the New Testament with two absolutely <laughs> divergent interpretations, there's no point going in and finding a third one, or a fourth one, or a fifth one. Go outside it first and see what else is happening in the world of its time, first century, first quarter, and see if what Jesus is doing makes sense in that context, and it makes absolute sense. He doesn't have to invent nonviolent resistance. It's there already. Hmm. And as far as I can say as a historian, subject to somebody who might know something else, I don't know of any other time before the homeland Jews in the first century who tried nonviolent resistance. Programmatic, I mean, organized, you know what I mean? Wow. Okay, so that might be... Uh, we're going to end the episode now, but that might be even... Uh, I don't know if it maybe a call to... Nonviolent activism. Well, we'll leave it at that because now is your time to tell me, according to the ideas on the book, what would be from your vantage point the most blasphemous idea you can think of when it comes to the pursuit of justice. Well, the most blasphemous idea we've already discussed, it's the idea in the book of Revelation that Jesus is coming back to slaughter anyone. It happens to be Romans, but anyone. Mm. That, that actually justice is primarily, essentially, particularly, or exclusively about punitive justice. Mm. Punitive justice. The, the way we use it actually in ordinary in ordinary everyday language in this country. We think of it as punitive justice. And the book of Revelation is the great final climactic monument to punitive justice. 
And I think it's a libel against God and Christ. Mm. The God I'm talking about is the God of the, the New Testament and the Christ who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Love it. To put it in the war. <laughs> All right, so that would be the most blasphemous. What, what is the idea where you're still skeptical of when it comes to the pursuit of justice or this dichotomy between the, the rule of the empire and the rule of God? Well, most skeptical would be I do not consider heaven as hell to be places in the future, but options in the present. Wow. I'm skeptical about whether our species, by skeptical, I mean doubtful. Mm -hmm. I'm doubtful whether our species can get control of its escalatory violence before it either destroys itself and or makes our world inhabit uninhabitable first. So put in other words, in, in biblical language, I'm not certain whether heaven or hell will win on earth. Wow. Wow, that was so good. Okay, so we're moving into Inspired. Where where do you see inspiration or what makes you hopeful despite you know, the doubtfulness? I'm hopeful because we don't seem to get away with it. <laughs> hmm. We don't seem to get away with it. That's, that's the only thing. And the... Th The visions of nonviolent resistance keep coming back even even when they seem to fail. There seems to be something in deep in the human spirit that is, I say, pro-heaven, if I could use that language again. Mm. Not just pro-hell. We're, we're not naturally, let me put it this way, we are not naturally violent. We are culturally violent. If we are naturally violent, then we may kiss our souls goodbye, <laughs> or any other part you want to kiss goodbye on your body. You can kiss our souls goodbye if we're naturally violent. Wow. That's all we will do. But I don't think we are. I've seen no reason. The witness of somebody like Jesus is a witness. Mm -hmm. It is a witness that you can live by that. It's a witness. Wow. doesn't mean it solves every case. Yeah. But it is a witness that it can be done. Therefore, we are not naturally violent. We're culturally violent, and we've been programmed by civilization, that this is, again, if I may use my metaphor, it's a drug of choice. We're addicted to it. Mm. And like any addiction, it's going to be an awful job, the withdrawal. Mm. To try and withdraw, withdraw from human violence as the normalcy of civilization. as something, you know, that we just do. Mm. We expect it. We, we may be shocked by Russia and Ukraine, but I haven't heard anyone who said, this is incredible. I just can't believe this happened. Hmm. What they're saying is right. We seem to be right back again to 1939 when Russia <laughs> invaded Poland from the east and we seem to have forgotten about it. And Finland two months later hmm. also. Have we forgotten <laughs> what happened in 1939? We think the Germans went east, which they did, but the Russians went west into Poland and Finland. So... We're, we're not we're not surprised. Mm. At least we shouldn't be if we know history. We should be appalled. Mm -hmm. Appalled, wow. but not surprised. And we should be thinking, what's going to happen? What, how do we get out of this bind? How do we get into withdrawal? <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow, that was so good. That was mind-blowing. That was hopeful. And also an invitation to pay attention to history I, I forgot who said this but you know in another episode somebody was mentioning somebody in uh, well whenever right I mean I'm sure you'll know but he said history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes um, yeah and I think that's a little bit of this sentiment of like as humans we <laughs> we're culturally violent right oh man that that strikes me okay but let's move on to hope <laughs> Or what, There's you want to say other, something? Yeah. One other thing, by the way, it rhymes, but exponentially. Mm. If it rhymed on the same level, we'd be all right. It rhymes wow. es with an escalation. That, yeah. that, yeah, it is right. It never comes up the same, but it's the escalation that's worried. 
you know, the the worst day of Roman slaughter in the Mediterranean couldn't kill every. It couldn't even take down the the olive trees. You take you take your sword to an olive tree. The olive tree is going to win. They couldn't do what we can do. No way could 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 any other empire there's ever been till now destroy the world. Mm. They couldn't even do it. Yeah. I mean, you know, when nightfall comes, you you can't hold your bloody sword anymore. We we can do it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, thank you for saying that. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the holy emoji. So, from your vantage point, what would be the the holiest idea, or what does holy mean in the pursuit of God's rule in the world of <laughs> Caesar lovers? Well, if you're not looking, I'm going to put very this very bluntly. I hope it doesn't offend too many people. If you're looking for magic, you can come up with all sorts of answers. If you're looking for superstition, you can come up with all sorts of answers. I'm talking about the answer within the biblical tradition and, as I think, within evolutionary challenge. Make the world a just place. Or we will make it hell on earth. I, I don't think the prescription is on new. I don't think it's novel. You can see why people who have been oppressed and who have been conquered and beaten down will rebel. It's hard not to think that, of course, there will be violence. Of course, there will. The only hope I can see is that we will become so appalled by our by ourselves, like any like what happens to somebody who's addicted the moment when they co- become appalled by it and say, if they can say it, I have to get out of this. No matter no matter what, I have to get out of this. Nothing I have to go through could be worse than what I'm in. Can we get to that point before it, we can't get out? <laughs> wow. So wow. the hope is yes, there mm. are answers. It's not like... I can't see any answer. It's it's like we've had answers down throughout history. So good. All right. And lastly would be <clears throat> what is the most divine idea? The whole the, the divine emoji. What is the the highest of all ideas uh, when it comes to the pursuit of God's rule in this world? It is that we are participates, participants in its creation on earth. That God's rule is not something that God's going to come down, send down like lightning bolts someday, and all we got to do is wait for it, hope for it, pray for it, expect it. It'll never, never happen. The message of Jesus is God's rule is permanently available. Get with the program. That's with it. Get with it. The idea that we're waiting for it to be done for us is the great human delusion. That's why it'll never happen. The message of Jesus, especially, was that's delusional. He 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 uses the example of the 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 mustard plant. Mm. Grow it. <laughs> it's a process. It's not a a zam bam whoop. <laughs> lightning strike and just wait for it, pray for it, hope for it, and it'll be done someday. No, never will. We are participants in a program. We're invited by God to share in cleaning up the mess we've made of the world. That's the invitation. It's a Zoom invitation <laughs> to get with the program. Wow. I find, I find that marvelous. I mean, that we have an active role And that without it, it will not happen. I'm kind of quoting from memory what Bishop Archbishop Tutu said in in Los Angeles um, way back. I'm going to say 1999 in Pasadena. My memory says, um, basically, God without us won't. We without God can't. Mm. He may not have said it that way, but he should have said it that way. <laughs> God without us won't. We without God can't. We need we need the transcendental leverage, as it were. Mm. Wow. To handle. Oh, oof. Dominic, that that is amazing. 
Okay, so we're going to end up with... Um, where can people find more of your work? Where do you want to point people to? Of course, you have this new book that it's just coming out today, right? Is it today? It's coming out, I think, tomorrow, the 29th. Is that tomorrow? Is it? 29th? Okay, so tomorrow. Yeah. Or whenever people are listening to the show, it'll be out. I'm not certain. It'll be out on March the 29th, whenever people are listening. Well, look, if they go on to Amazon, I have a whole page on Amazon. Um, there's, I've been writing since 1966. And all my books are, are on there. But they could start with this one. And if they think they find that challenging, that's the word I would use. Challenging, then they can, you know, follow their mind back into into Amazon. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all there. Love Most it. of the, ones, the last 30 years have been published by Harper One of San Francisco. So they're all there on their pages too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dominic, for being on the show. Render onto Caesar the struggle for Christ and culture in the New Testament. My friends, I'll see you guys on the next one. Make sure you visit us at christianpodcast.com for more emojis, more fun and in-depth of our episodes. I'll see you guys on the next one. <laughs>